Ben Friedman's cell phone. I'm not able to get the phone right now, but if you leave your name and number, I'll call you back. At the tone, please record your message. When you have finished recording, you may hang up or press 1 for more options. Yo, bro. What's up? It's, uh, it's Ruzi. Um, you know, I heard you couldn't get that sample clip for that intro song. I can't believe that. It's freaking weird. I didn't, like... I, I thought Loud Luxury was, like, our poise. Like, how is a label telling them what to do? Anyways, um, like, obviously you need an intro now, and you already know I got a, I got a good voice, and, you know, I kind of sing like JB, so, like, I don't know, like, what if I just, like, Juggernaut podcast, Juggernaut, Juggernaut podcast, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Bro, imagine that with some auto-tune and a beat. Holy. Heard you couldn't get the song cleared. So I had to make some of fire for your ear. It's the best show on earth. Yeah, it's called Juggernaut. Juggernaut Podcast. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Juggernaut, Juggernaut Podcast, yeah. All right, we are live yeah, right yeah, now, this second. Yeah, yeah. You are now tuned in to the wildest show on planet Earth, the Juggernaut Podcast, episode one. What a moment that we're living in right now and everybody wanted to know, who will you get for episode one? I'm gonna tell you a little secret right now. We got some big time guests coming up. Oh, we already filmed a million episodes of this, but for episode one, there's some things we had to get out of the way. And before anything else, I'm a showman. And I had to get the biggest guests in the entire world. It's episode one, it's a special episode. A guy who's about as handsome as anyone you can find, a man who, whose genius knows no bounds, and who's probably the funniest person, unbiased, I would say he's probably the funniest person on planet Earth. And I'm happy to tell you we landed him. And uh, here joining me in studio today, all the way from Chesterfield, Missouri, Ben Friedman. <laughs> What's up, dude? <laughs> what is that jacket, man? I don't know, bro, this jacket's sick, what do you mean? I bet you wish you had this jacket. I don't know. I mean, I do have that <laughs> jacket. But anyways, I don't want to fight. I don't want, I'm not here to argue with you today. Okay. So everybody asks, where have you been? What have you been doing? I'm going to ask you first and foremost, how about the person? How are you on the inside? I got to be honest in this moment. I, it's a beautiful moment. I feel like I got like Mountain Dew Baja Blast running through my veins right now. I'm like excited. I'm just happy, man. This is a beautiful moment. The first Juggernaut podcast, episode one. I've been waiting on this one, I'm not gonna lie. There's been a lot of ups and downs, we're gonna get to that. But right now, I don't know, like, you know those fish, like when they drop the fish out of the plane, like the, and they're like flowing out, like it looks like Blastoise, like projectile vomiting out of his like stomach. You know what I'm talking about, the planes? I feel like one of those trout right now. Like in the air, maybe they feel disoriented. I don't feel that disoriented, but that rush they must feel like that's kind of what's going on in my head right now it's a beautiful moment man i'm feeling i'm feeling zen though overall like i don't know if those trout feel zen but like i've been doing my yoga shout out to camp tampa i'm a yogi now you know i'm doing my vinyasas that's i'm about to do some verbal vinyasas it's a beautiful moment we got a lot to talk about today all right so everybody wants to know the questions why'd you leave barstool where have you been what's your favorite color of ice cream or whatever I know most people have a lot of questions right now, and I know why, because I went dark for two years. Whatever you questions you have, I'm here to answer it today, and we're gonna get into it. Like, it feels good, it's, it's, I feel relief right now. I finally get to talk about this stuff. I know there's a lot of questions. And the beautiful thing is, baby, we're, we're live now, so we're going, and you're gonna get everything, maybe some stuff you didn't wanna know. Maybe some stuff that you didn't know that you wanted to know, that you wanted to know, if that makes sense. So let's get straight into it. Obviously, there's a lot to go over, but the first thing I think everyone wants to know, how, why, when, what led to you leaving Barcel? Dude, okay, so here's the deal. When it comes to me leaving Barcel and everyone's like, dude, what happened? To me, it's an integral part of the story, me coming to Barcel, right? Because I wasn't working at some media company or like some big wig thing. Dude, I was living in my parents' basement making white rapper music videos. What? So I don't know, people might not know this. I'm from Missouri, which is not like, not really something a lot of people brag about. I don't even know how to describe it. Since I was the tiniest kid, the thing that I loved more than anything on this planet is like sharks and, and nature and snakes and the ocean. And I loved documenting it. So 
my whole childhood, I always like look up Steve Irwin, like Jeff Corwin. I'd always be trying to make my own fishing shows, nature shows, filming stuff. So then when the NHL didn't work out, which is, which is an ongoing thing because I still may make the NHL. I just want to put that out there. Like if there's a GM, call me, bro. Like, well, you know what I mean? Like, let's talk because it's not, the dream's never dead. But after college, I'm in St. Louis, Missouri, and I was trying to make music videos. I was trying to be a rapper, which just like the NHL, sadly, did not really pan out the exact way I thought. And I was working at a production company. It was kind of an internship. The internship was kind of run its course. And they're like, people are like, it's time to get a job, right? And at this time, I had read Barcel Sports from, my dad showed me Barcel in like 2008. Now I remember there was this guy like, Stool Presidente, it said like, keep reading bitches on the bottom. Like, dude, this is old school. Like, it was in Boston, and I had been reading it. I, when I was in college, I played hockey with a bunch of these kids that were from Boston. So then it became cool. I was like, oh, I know Barstool, and all of a sudden I'm going back to my dad. Dad, show me, you know, send me that stuff that you told me. And at that point, I had been reading it for what is, I, I'm not a math guy, but 2008, 2009 to 2016, like religiously. I might have read every word that Dave and KFC had written that whole time. So I knew, knew it like the back of my hand. So when Barstool got bought by Chernin in 2016, they started hiring a few more people. And I'll never forget, I was sitting on Bush Wildlife, Lake 34, bouncing this jig like, and I remember like, it, sometimes you're just thinking about stuff so much that it's just like an epiphany. I was like, they, they had just done, like they had chiclets, they had like RA and Whitney, whatever. So I was like, okay, I can't be the hockey guy. I love hockey. They have sports, they have football, all this stuff, but no one's like a nature guy. And I'm like, I'm the nature guy. And I just had this epiphany standing on Lake 34 Bush Wildlife in St. Louis. And at this point, it's coinciding. So I made this music video called Young Page Views. I had this another epiphany in Faust Park walking. I'm like, I'm gonna make a music video. It's gonna get on Barstool, then I'm gonna be famous. That was my kind of thought process. So I made the music video called Young Page Views because that was the whole concept was I did all these parodies of like Dave's life. Every single, like it was like pretty good too. It was like pretty spot on, right? And I made it and all the lyrics were like me as Dave. And I was like, the whole thing was like, I was, I felt like Dave right before he was like made Barcel, whatever. So I make the music video, Dave follows me. I begging him for an interview. I'd send him photoshops every single day. I'd send him all this stuff and Finally, he's like, you want to come in for an interview? And at this point, it's funny, I made the music video, but that kind of had nothing to do with what I thought I was going to do for them. My whole plan was, I'm going to be the bar outdoors guy. And I made all this stuff. I flew to Florida, filmed me like catching sharks. Ended up, he said, you can come in next Tuesday works. It was a Friday. And I was trying to get this tiger, dude, and it was $10,000, and they wouldn't, they had to get this permit, and I couldn't get a tiger. So I'm calling all the places. I'm like, next Tuesday could be the one after or this one, but I'm not gonna lose my chance. He told me I could come into Barcel. I'm driving across the country and I took one of my best friends, Jamie Buchanan, and I had him, I'm like, bro, we're gonna make a documentary of me trying to get a job at Barcel, and I'm gonna be like the Barcel Outdoors guy and that's my pitch in. So we drove across the country from Missouri to New York City. I picked up a wallaby, I was like calling everywhere and couldn't get the tiger, it was 10 grand, didn't have the permit, so I get this wallaby, Winston Wallaby, a guy that I owe a lot, you know? Like this dude did, he was there for me. So I walk into the office and I tell Dave, I'm gonna be your outdoors. I had the wallaby, Dave's like, what's going on? He thought we were gonna get like some like organization called on us. He's like, is this legal, what's going on? I come in like dressed like, kind of like Steve Irwin with the wallaby, I'm like, I said, Barstool Outdoors, Barstool Shark Fishing, which looking back is kind of an insane thing to pitch someone. Like, I'm gonna come in and do shark fishing, which I kind of thought maybe that would just be my thing. I just catch sharks all day, which anyways. So that was a pivotal moment in the whole story. I came to Davis, it's 2016. I'm like, I wanna be the Barstool Outdoors guy. And he was like, so you wanna be the outdoors guy? I'm like, I am your outdoors guy. And I, dude, I was sauced up. Like, I was like, I'm doing it. It was the scariest thing in my life to go and like walk into Barcel, dude. I'd read this guy every day for years. And Dave's like an intimidating figure to just walk into. He's very like quick and like all this stuff. Like when I looked at him in real life the first time, I'm like, holy shit, dude. It's like the first time I saw like a giant, like the first time I saw like a big tiger shark and you kind of get that like, you kind of like flinch almost. Like when I saw Dave, I'm like, and the tiger shark can't talk. Like Dave can talk. I'm like scared, but I was like, 
took all of my bravery. I'm like, I want to be a Barca Outdoors guy, whatever. Did the interview. I stayed there all week. He's like, hey, he calls me in his office, which is terrifying. He's like, we have a spot for you. Have you ever seen The Office? I'm like, yeah, of course, dude. I've seen, every, I've never seen it. I, to this day, I've never watched The Office ever. But if, what am I going to say to Dave? He could have said, have you ever, do you know Sesame Street every episode? I'd be like, yeah, dude, of course. Like, I just wanted a job. He could I could have walked tight ropes, whatever. He's like, we want you to do this thing, stool scenes, and you're going to basically make The Office for Barcel. And I was so unbelievably grateful, and it literally changed my life to go from living in my parents' basement in Missouri, I don't know what I would be doing right now. Now I had a job at Barcel, and it was everything. But I was a little bit like, no, like, I was like a little bit crushed, right? Because I'm like, dude, I was on this like, this heroic like mission where I was like, I'm gonna be this outdoors guy, and it took all of my courage to like, go up there and have this whole plan. More than anything in the world, my entire life's dream and my passion, my whole time growing up, my whole time, like from two years old to like literally the day I'm in there, I'm like, I want to have my own nature show and outdoor show. And I wanted to be like a personality on Barcel. I didn't want to just be filming other people. And like, listen, I knew if I got my foot in the door there and did stool scenes every inch as good as I could possibly do it and stir it up and get drama. Dude, people used to be like attacking me in that office. Like literally, I'd be like physically assaulted, stirring it up, doing all this stuff. I knew as long as I did that, Every night, weekend, holiday, vacation, I was gonna work on Bar Saw Doors. I made that Instagram account in my parents' basement in Missouri. Like, I remember when it had zero followers, like, screenshot it, like, one day, like, whatever. This was like my life's work, right? So I drive back to St. Louis, get all my stuff, drove back to New York, and I start working at Bar Saw. And every day, I'd be doing stool scenes. The whole first two years, I'm there every night, every weekend. I, dude, I literally wore like animal clothes every single day to work. Like I'd wear camo and like alligator shirts because I'm like, I need to be the bar saw. I am the bar saw doors guy. I will stop at nothing. So that whole first year, whole second year, every weekend I'd finish stool scenes. Maybe it'd be Saturday, maybe it'd be Friday night, take the last train over to New Jersey, or I'd take the last flight out, go do stuff, come back Sunday night. Every single night, every weekend I'm posting stuff. I'm finding stuff, I'm meeting people, I'm building the page, and I'm filming bar saw door stuff. So, 2018, I'm still doing stool scenes, doing all this, start trying to, the episodes start coming together a little bit, and it was almost like this like ongoing running joke in, in the office, oh, bar saw door is coming soon, because it was like, I would promote it all the time, and I'd run the Instagram page, like I'd be at Thanksgiving dinner, like posting bar saw doors. It was my dream. Like I got to make this platform where I'd see like a python, like eating a cow. And I'd be like, dude, and pe I'd have a hundred thousand people viewing it and commenting. It was the coolest thing in the world. 2019, on my birthday, I took all the footage I had ever filmed in my life. Like I'm talking GoPro clips from like 2013, like whatever, everything I'd ever done. And I made this trailer, right? On my birthday, I'm like, the best present I could possibly have is I'm gonna finally put out this trailer. Barcel Outdoors was like a covert operation because I knew if I was doing that too much or something, Dave might kill it and be like, you can't, your job is stool scenes, focus on stool scenes. So the entire time I'm doing Barcel Outdoors, I felt like I was like a spy or something, right? Like I'd, like, I'd be like Clark Kent and Superman, like I'd be doing stool scenes all day and night, making it as good as I can. And then I'd like sneak off and I'd be working on my stuff like in the cover of darkness, right? So this was a big moment, 2019, where I'm like, I'm gonna put out this trailer. I didn't know at that moment if I'm gonna put out this Bar Slot Doors trailer and Dave's gonna be like, don't do this anymore. <laughs> like I didn't know everything I'd done, every nights, weekends, whatever, because I could see him being like, you do still scenes, this is what you get paid to do, focus on that, right? And the trailer, I put it out, it was Saturday afternoon, and I'll never forget, it got like a million views in the first day. Which like, shout out, like, all these people from Barstool, bigger people, all these people were supporting it and retweeting it. Partially because I knew, like, they knew that I was working on it all the time. They knew how much it meant to me. But I'm so grateful. That moment changed my life, and Dave called me in the office on that Monday. This is 2019, you gotta realize, this mission had been going on since 2016. And I was so nervous. I'm like, oh my God, like, is he gonna kill it? Is he gonna kill me? Like, I don't know what he's gonna do. And he's like, oh, like, you know, cause it got so many views and the reviews were so positive. I'm like, he's like, hey, like, uh, you know, maybe you can do some of that more outdoor stuff now. And like, you know, have somebody help you with stool scenes. I'm telling you, 
that moment, like, I'm like, oh my God. Like, not only did Dave acknowledge it and was like, we had, like, I looked him in the face and he said the words bar saw doors. I'm like, I was like shaking. I'm like, what? Like, oh my God. It's like my dream is like happening. And before then it was all nights, weekends on my own dime. I'm paying every dollar because once again, I knew how do I get this to not get shut down is I'm going to do it on my own money because what can they say? If I'm using Barstool resources, they could have said, hey, this is not a good use of our time or money. If I'm doing it on my own time, my own money, I will make this happen and I will stop at nothing. So the reason why I tell that backstory is this meant the fucking world to me. Like this meant everything. This entire concept of Barstool Outdoors was everything from me being a little kid to me being a teenager to filming you know stuff on vacations like I'm from Missouri the only time I got to film shark stuff was when we went on Christmas break to the Keys you know what I mean so when this trailer came out February 9th on 2019 dude oh my god like it still makes me smile just thinking and now I look at that trailer there's things I want to change whatever but dude it was everything so at that point we started getting the episodes together and it started to be like, hey, this is something you can put out on Barcel. I'm like, dude, I went from, people used to call me the human tripod, like all this stuff, like I was so insecure about it because I'm like, I'm in the office with all these people and I knew like, I'm like, dude, I know that I can like be one of these people, but I always felt like a second class citizen, you know, like I'm like, yeah, I'm worked for Barcel and I'm one of the people, but I'm like, my job is to film the other people. Like I felt insecure about my place as like a true creator there, a personality there. And I'm like, I know I can do it. So now I'm about to put my show out there. Like, You're, you can put Barca Outdoors. I'm like, oh my God, right? It was the most personal product you could imagine. So at this time, 2019, if you're an NHL fan, you may know this. If you're not, welcome to the show because I, there was a little guy named Boris the Chinchilla that <laughs> another person who I owe a lot of stuff to. And I'm shout out to Boris. Boris is alive and well. People always ask me that. Boris is so alive, like he's never been more alive. This guy is thriving. He's living in Chinchilla retirement. Long story short, this Chinchilla won St. Louis the Stanley Cup. Basically, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I had this Chinchilla, I would do this dance in my underwear in my apartment, which I know is like, people are like, what is this? Did I change the wrong channel? So I had this Chinchilla, I would start doing these dances like in my underwear in these like swim trunks in my apartment in New York City every time the Blues won. 2019, the St. Louis Blues, after 52 years or whatever it was, ended up winning the Stanley Cup. Every single thing went my way. It was the luckiest thing in the entire world. So Barcelona Outdoors, we were going to release it that spring, and we kept pushing it back because this Blues run kept happening. So many storylines. The Blues beat the Bruins in Boston in Game 7, and somehow I'm standing on the ice like in Game 7 with the Stanley Cup. Not somehow. Shout out to the big rig, Pat Maroon, but... It was like the craziest thing. So now not only had Barcelona Outdoors was like green lit to happen. All of a sudden, I went from having like 30,000 followers or whatever it was to like 100,000 in a span of like a month or something. It was insane, right? I'm on camera, I'm on Barcelona Radio with Dave. We're like doing these live shows. All of a sudden, people are like reading my stuff, watching my things for me before Barcelona Outdoors ever came out. The most miraculous chain of events in history and at least the most miraculous pertaining to a chinchilla ever, maybe in world history. All of a sudden, now the Stanley Cup, the Blues won it. I'm in the parade. I'm speaking. I'm looking like Kim Jong-un in front of like 100,000 people giving speeches at the rally. Like, dude, your brain is like warped, bro. Like, I, there's no one on earth that could have dance in your underwear with a chinchilla, go from holding a camera to all of a sudden you're on stage in front of 100,000 people, and my show hadn't even came out yet. So now it comes time to drop Barcelona Outdoors. The first episode of Barcelona Outdoors meant more to me than anything in the world because every single drop of energy that went from when I was a little kid trying to make an outdoor show into that moment, like it was like, uh, if, if people are, we're at MMG Studios right now, people familiar with Rick Ross is deeper than rap. Like this was deeper than rap at that point. It wasn't a video. Like some people might watch that and be like, bro, it's a fishing show, like relax. Like, Dude, this was like my life's journey, going from a little kid, like showing my dad like a you know snapper this big to like I had my own show. And when that came out, the reviews, like Bar Saw Doors episode one, people were like, Erica texts me, she's like, I can't believe Barstool, I can't believe we did this. There was all these scientists like, this is crazy footage, all this stuff. I'm like, 
when I tell you, so this is an important point, right? First two years at Barstow, I'm scared of my own shadow. The blues thing, I put out the trailer, which all of a sudden it started the wheels of I'm gonna be like a content person. So I somehow finessed my way into being on camera with like my underwear and a chinchilla. All of a sudden this outdoor show, which I did in the cover of darkness on nights and weekends, comes out and it's good and it's getting all these views and people are like loving it. And man, for the first time, since I walked into that office, I kind of find I was like, I had this like sense of almost relief, right? My entire life had changed probably more than when I went, was living in my parents' basement to getting the job doing stool scenes. That was an enormous shift. But like 2019, it's like, I mean, listen, I worked my ass off, but it was also some of the luckiest bounces a fella has ever gotten in their life, right? And I'm not like, I, I captured them like I was, doing all the stuff and making the videos and I grinded, but man, everything went my way. It was like, 2019 was like a movie script, right? People are stopping me on the street. I'm walking by, they're like, dude, that Python stuff is crazy. I'm like in Manhattan, I'm like, oh my God. Like it's hard to describe. It was like being in heaven, but in real life. I swear to God, I know that sounds dramatic, but like it was the coolest thing ever. And now we're going to do season two. In season one, we just put out, right? Like we didn't know what was gonna happen. Now all of a sudden it did so well, season two, we're in these meetings. They're talking about all these sponsorships for Barstow Doors. I had literally come through the television screen of like being a Barstow fan. Then I got in there, but I'm filming. Then I had my show of like, okay, they're letting me do this. Now I'm literally making money for Barstow, doing Barstow Doors. It's hard to describe the flip on its head. I went from terrified of my own shadow, like filming people eating lunch, to all of a sudden, I'm in these meetings, they're like, why Pete, what do you, I'm in 10 people, dude. I got this guy, All Business Pete, who I absolutely love. He's like, he's like looking at me like, man, I gotta be in the meeting. This guy's like, we're asking him stuff in the meeting. All the video people are like, why Pete, what are your ideas for season two? I'm like, this is the craziest thing in my life. And it definitely shifted my perspective without a question, right? I went from terrified of Dave to like, he'd walk by me and I was like, hey, like I finally felt like I had some sort of key, like, like, I had earned my way in there of being a legitimate person that worked there, an on-camera person. I had the radio show on Sirius. I had my show, I'm, and I knew in these sales meetings, I'm like, we're making way more for this show that I'm doing than I'm getting paid. I'm like, oh my God, and we're selling merch. Like, that blues run, we, had to, we sold hundreds of thousands of dollars in merch that I'm like, it just, I finally felt like I had done something there and like I belonged to be there, right? Okay. I told you it was deeper than rap, as they say. As this, I don't know if people know that Rick Ross album, but that's the only thing I can think of. It's deeper than rap. It's, it's outside the lines. So 2019, the show's doing well. I am the bar slot doors guy, actually now. Like I had said it before, I'd been working in the shadows. Now I'm him. I'm like, oh my God, this is the happiest thing in my life. Very late 2019, I'm in New York City with the goons, with all my goons, probably in this exact jacket, which is actually funny, but I go out on a Friday night, 310 Bowery, a place, shout out to, to Mel, Ollie, everyone there, all my stand in Bowery, nobody does it better. And I meet a person, right? Very late 2019. Like there's very few people that in your entire life that like you remember from the moment you met them, it changed your life, you know? Like fundamentally changed your life. And I meet a person, the smartest person I'd ever met, a girl. If you know the story, you might know it's a girl, but for storytelling's sake, it's a girl. The smartest person I'd ever met, the funniest, like clever, just like, the way I could describe the most is like, I was more me with, with this person than I was like by myself. Like, I don't know how to say it. I never met a cooler, more like confident person in my life, right? And there's something just magnetic about it. But like over the top of everything, I think my number one like thing that I could say is just like, I couldn't believe that I had found like the biggest, like cutest, just like giant dork in the world. I was just head over heels or whatever's past head over heels from the second I met this person on. And the reason why I bring this up is because everything in my life in 2019 had just kind of blossomed in this, in, in this beautiful way, right? Like, work and all these crazy cool occurrences and everything had just kind of bloomed into this moment. And then when I met this girl, without question, 
my mentality 100% shifted when it came to like life as far as like where I was. And you know, I'm 28 years old, I'm looking at this person who I'm like, for the first time in my life, I kind of thought, oh wow, this is where kind of that next chapter was almost incepted into my head of like, oh, this is where this goes next. And I started thinking different. And without a question, the reason why I bring this up in the midst of all this, A, it was an enormous event in my life, but number two, it definitely shifted my perspective on Varsal and kind of my career and where I wanted to be. You kind of start to think of yourself in a little different terms of like, oh, I may be a person that's gonna be a husband, you know, in the next couple years or in the near future. Not just, you know, sleeping on the floor of an office doing chinchilla dances, like, it kind of changed my perspective on what I wanted from Barcel, what I wanted for my career, and kind of like things that I wanted, how I wanted to be viewed, or like, it really shifted a lot of things. Now, the clock flips to 2020, and I'm doing what I love, which makes me so unbelievably happy. I'm getting people calling me, like networks had called me, they're like, DM me, we want to do a show with you on this channel, like with Barcel Without. I'm like, what is going on? Like a year before this, I'm like the guy filming Trent eat his salad for lunch and now people are calling me and now I got this girl too that it's like no two people ever had more fun than like me and her had. So we go to start filming season two and the beginning of the shoots are supposed to be February, March, which I don't know if anyone out there remembers March 2020. Maybe one of the less than usual months in everyone's time on earth. So the first shoot, the craziest thing, I was supposed to fly to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It was the day like when the NBA shut down and Rudy Gobert touched all the mics and like Tom Hanks got COVID. That's when COVID started. Like when Tom Hanks got COVID, that was like the first day. And I flew out the next day. We're filming all this stuff and COVID starts. And it was insane. It was a crazy time of life, right? And for everything. And we're filming season two of Barcelona Outdoors, which there was a lot of like, it was like obviously hard to travel. Like that shows a lot of traveling and filming different stuff. I'm like, we can't really fly around. We had all this stuff planned all over the country. You can't really do that. But we're making it happen. To me, I'm like, wow, this is, I'm crushing it. We're filming the Labatt cast, which is sponsored on the paddleboards live stream a couple times a week. My girlfriend was getting eaten by mosquitoes and stuff. Like, like I'm like, like we're grinding. You know what I'm saying? Like we're filming all this stuff. We're paddling back in the mangroves. I like, we're filming the Labatt cast. We're driving around Florida everywhere in the, the social content that I was able to make living in Florida far surpassed anything that I was able to do while living in Manhattan, right? Because everyone knows New York City, maybe not the outdoors capital of the world is one way to put it. And especially not during COVID where you can't leave your apartment. So I'm living in New Smyrna Beach and every day, like I'd go down, I'd be like, okay, I'm gonna go put, uh, like I'd see this crab. I'm like, I'm gonna go find this crab and make a video about it and teach, you know, I do these little like, nature videos teaching people about it. I'd go catch a shark and talk to people about it. And the social content during that time, all of our accounts, my account grew like double. Barcelona Outdoors grew like hundreds of thousands during this time. And I'm like, 100% there was definitely a shift in my mind a little bit where all of a sudden I'm not in buildings all the time. I'm not like in trash and rats and all this stuff. The content was better than it had been and we're getting better numbers. So to me, I kind of was like, well, if I can show that this is viable and the accounts grow better and I can make more outdoors content, if I'm the outdoors guy, I definitely was drawn to Florida and definitely had a resentment against going back into the office at that point, right? And was that wrong? Was that right? I don't know, right? But this is my honest feelings at the time. I'm like, this is the most fun thing in my entire life. Also, I'm living with my girlfriend's family in New Smyrna Beach. I mean, it was the most fun thing I could have possibly imagined. We're like riding in the golf cart to go get coffee and like all this stuff. It was so fun. Like, I don't know how to describe it, but made season two happen. And was it the wild extravaganza that it was going to be before when it was like, you know, flying to Hawaii and all this stuff? No, but during March, April, and May of 2020 and COVID, we filmed season two of outdoors and i was like the numbers of all the social stuff and we got the season done a sponsored season during covid i'm thinking it's going great so season two finishes and we go to do season three of Barcelona outdoors now every time there's a sales cycle there's obviously a little bit of like you have to wait a little bit because once you film the stuff integrated content is worth way more than stuff that's like shot and then added in after so at that time i'm like okay 
why would we go, why would I go back to, this is in like July, right? August. I'm like, why would I go back to New York City right now and sit in an apartment? Like there was still, COVID was still real at that time in New York City. And I'm like, let's just film season three while I'm still down here. And then when I go back to the office, I'll have a full season. Now at this point, we'd had a full year of this thing growing and we're filming and doing all stuff. Season three of Bar Slot Doors, which who knows, maybe people will get to see it someday, maybe not, foreshadowing. It was the nastiest thing of all time. We had Steve Ranella, we had Mike Iaconelli, we had Alex Kalorn, Pat Maroon. I'm trying to think, we had all this crazy stuff. I would say the first major, the first major plot point in this entire, in the, in the ending saga, I would say is in late September of 2020, I go to, go to Montana. This was a very special trip for a few different reasons. But I had been talking to a bunch of people from Meat Eater, people that worked there that did podcasts or did shows, but not Steve. But I knew, to me, Meat Eater was like the creme de la creme of outdoor stuff. Still is, but I'm saying like at that time, I'm like, what collab could we do that would take this to the next level that's like bigger than anyone else? So I knew some of those people from Meat Eater and I knew they're in Montana. There's a, there's a saying that we talk about called hanging around the hoop, right? Sometimes you've got to get up there, be around there, meet some people, talk to people, and good things happen. So I go up there. This trip was very special for a few reasons. Long story short, go on this trip to Montana. I got engaged on a Sunday on top of a mountain. For my money, the num I think it was the most fire engagement of all time. Maybe not in like long-term results category, but in like of that day, listen, it was a beautiful moment, happiest day of my entire life. It was on a weekend on a trip. So I paid for all the flights on this trip to Montana, all the, the rental cars, all the lodging, all everything for good reason. I went up there, I got engaged on the weekend before. And also I'm like, what's the difference if I'm blogging and filming outdoor stuff from Florida or Montana? To me, I was doing extra credit. Like I'm like, I paid for all the stuff myself. I went to go film this episode in Montana for Bar Saw Doors season three. And we filmed the episode on that Wednesday of that week with Sam Lundgren, great dude, fly fishing, another episode that may never see the light of day, but it was beautiful. And um, great episode. Come back to Florida. And I started getting some stuff like, you know, that week. Obviously, when you post a picture of you getting engaged, there's a lot of chatter. And it was obviously a little faster than some engagements that last for seven years. Like, and that's the, that's the facts, brother. I can't change that. So obviously, a lot of people are saying stuff. And it was probably little, you know, like, not shocking, but it's like, I'm sure Dave and all these people, like when one of your employees gets engaged, like obviously you're going to talk about it. And it's like, it's not like I was in our pajamas on the couch and some private thing. Like I went on top of a mountain and I like got this, like it was very over the top. So I, it's okay. I get it. Obviously people are going to talk about it, but I didn't really know any Dave had said anything. And at that point, then the next week I start getting all of this tweets and things oh like you know yp is just on vacation in the himalayas or whatever like it's kind of funny looking back now but like at the time all of a sudden that like terrifiedness starts coming back in right in the in the and i'm shitting my butt i'm like i remember texting frankie like because that dave said on his podcast he was like gonna come pop up where i was and i'm like scared shitless dude now i'm texting frankie yo where's dave is he on the plane is he i'm terrified like i remember being in the keys looking and granted now, let me reiterate, during this time, we just filmed with Meat Eater. We're filming the, these episodes, Nick Stanzik, all this stuff. We're getting this insanely good like content for Bar Saw Doors season three. And in my mind, I kind of thought like, that's my job. Like I'm doing good. I was blogging at the time. I remember like all blue stuff, everything. So I filmed the Meat Eater episode. I'm back from Montana in Florida. We're season, filming season three. Everything to me, I'm, I'm the happiest guy in the world. I just got engaged to the girl, my dreams. I'm like, if I was on cloud nine before, I'm on cloud nine trillion, whatever it is. I'm so, I'm like, this is unbelievable. And I get someone from uh, our video department or someone tells me, hey, like Meat Eater just reached out. Like Steve Rennell is like looking for you. And I think him and like his wife or someone had like followed me. Next thing you know, like I remember I was sitting at Green Turtle in the Keys in Isla Mirada, and I get a text and he's like, hey, this is Steve Rennell. And I'm like, Dude, I'd watch this guy, like, I've watched every Meat Eater episode ever, right? And this dude texts my phone. I'm like, oh my God. 
I knew when I went into the meat eater stuff, I'm like, you never know what's gonna happen. I was hopeful, but never in my wildest dreams. I'm like, oh my God, it took two weeks. So in my mind at this point, I pay for this trip on my own money, which I should have, because if you're getting engaged and doing all this hoopla, you know, whatever. It's not like I asked them for stuff, but we filmed an episode for a sponsored thing for Barcel. I get in with these meat eater people, meet them, kind of shake their tree a little bit, and all of a sudden, the biggest guy in all of outdoors is reaching out to me, and they want to do something. They're like, they want to do a, a series with you and Steve, like a mini-series thing, because he was putting a book out. I'm like, oh my God, I felt like a magician. I'm like, dude, how is this keep happening? Like, whatever 2019, the magic was still going, which it didn't go forever. Let's just say that. The magic's coming to an end soon. So we have all these production meetings with Meat Eater and all this stuff, and it's like, I remember I was taking pictures on the Zoom of like, like sneak pictures of Renella on the little Zoom box because I couldn't believe I'm on a fucking Zoom with this guy. I literally was so starstruck. I was like with my phone, like taking pictures, like where he couldn't, and he was just sitting in an office. Like one of them, I don't even think his video was on, but it just said like SR. And I was like, like that's Steve. Like I was like, holy shit, this guy was like my idol. So we go to do the thing and we negotiate all of it. We're like, okay, we're gonna do this series. We're gonna trap beavers with Steve and we are gonna hunt a white-tailed deer and we're gonna do some survival thing. Like the book was a survival book. So we get through all the meetings and the entire time I had done bar saw doors, Dave was always very anti-hunting, like pro animals, like would, would always make kind of jokes and comments, oh, YP wrestles sharks and he, you know, like he tortures sharks, like cause me shark fishing or even when I was like tagging him and like we went through all the stuff. I'm like, I know Dave's a showman. Like it doesn't always have to be like a X's and O's conversation. Like if he's like, no, you torture sharks. And then it's like, dude, we're tagging him for science. Like he would beat me on all this stuff. So. The entire time when I told you, when I was doing bar saw doors, the shadows, all I could do is just not have it get shut down. Well, doing hunting stuff, when Dave's like an animal guy and very anti-hunting, I knew I could, like that was like black and white. I definitely can't do that. So I knew that whole time. So we get through with the last calls with Meat Eater and Steve's like, oh, I'll see you soon, man. We're like going to book flights. And I'm like, oh my God. I'm like, me and Steve, I had like texting them, like, you know, guys being dudes and like, this is going to be us, like pictures of people trapping beavers and stuff. And like, I was like, this is insane, right? I'm like nervous. This guy's like the top, right? Like he's on all the biggest shows, everything. We get off the call, I'm elated. And I remember the, the rest of the video people like, you know, when you get off of Zoom, then you all immediately call each other separately and talk about it. I'm like, I'm acting like we just won the Stanley Cup. Like, I'm like. Like I'm thinking like, you know what I mean? Like I'm walking back in like this Zoom, like like doing the McGregor, like Billy Strut, like walking in the ring. I'm like, hey guys, like me, Renella, whatever, I'm thinking it. And they're like, oh, well, like they were, they're like, you got to call, Dave. like you got to ask Dave. I'm like, what? Like, what do you mean? Ask Dave, we're, I'm, it's me and Renella. I'm like already taping like Photoshops and me and Steve to my wall. I'm like, what do you mean we got to ask Dave? She's like, an animal will be killed. Like, I'll never forget. She's like, an animal will be killed on this production. So you have to clear it with Dave because we've never done that before, right? So, and they were like, he's going to Miami this weekend. Don't text him right now. He's, he's not, like, text him next week. I'm like, all right. And I'm kind of like, bro, what? Like, we're doing this show with Ronella. What do you mean, wait? And Mediator's like trying to book stuff. I'm like, dude, Steve, like, I'm in. Just so you know, like, I'm in. They're like, waiting. So I text Dave next week early on this long thing. Here's what it is. Meat Eater, this giant thing. Meat Eater is very important in the outdoor space because X, Y, and Z. Uh, here's what we're going to do for the thing, and this is why I need your clearance. We're going to do this beaver. They're nuisance beavers. You know, they're going to be killed anyways, whatever. Text them. Nothing. Text them again two days later. Meanwhile, Meat Eater is hitting us up. Are we booking this? Are we? And I'm like, bro, this is the biggest thing we could possibly do. Like, what are we doing? Text him again shorter. Hey, did you see this last message? Nothing. I'm like, hey, finally I sent it in like very short things. We wanted uh, mediators down to do this collaboration. This guy's big. He's been on this thing. Here's what we want to do here. Short bullet points. Finally, I'll never forget. I was in Yeehaw Junction, Florida. I look it up because I remember there's like this broken down hotel on the left hand side. Because I was driving across the film with Mike Iaconelli and all this stuff and like, and I'll never forget because remember when I told you I'd be terrified of anything like Dave interacting with? 
He wrote back, and this is after all these texts. Like, it was almost to the point where I'm texting, like, I wasn't even that scared. Anytime you'd text Dave, you'd get, like, a jolt because it's, like, scary and it's your boss. But at this point, he hadn't responded. I was like, okay, like, at this point, I'm almost got a call. Like, some, like I don't know what to do because Mediator needs an answer. And this was the biggest thing we'd ever done. And I'll never forget, I was in Yeehaw Junction because I got so scared, I pulled off the road to the right across from the broken down hotel. And he just wrote back, how long is your contract for and I'm like, I was sitting there with my fiance. I'm like, what does this mean? <laughs> I think you would have thought it was a Da Vinci code. I'm like, is he gonna fire me? Like, I thought that he was gonna like fire me because I asked to do hunting content. Like, I was so like, I don't know what does that mean. And I'm like, does he mean how long is the deal between us and Meat Eater? Like, I was just terrified, right? It's like four words or whatever that is. I'm not a math guy. And next thing you know, I was like, what do I say? We're like trying to figure it out. I was like, I'm like. If he's gonna fire me because of that, I might like I'm fucked anyway. So I'm like, I'm just gonna say, take it as like how long is the deal between me and Meat Eater? So I type back, I'm like, oh, it would only be for like a few weeks. Like, I don't know, I was, I was so scared, bro. Like when Dave texts you, you it's it's like you're working with a ping pong ball up here. Like it was literally it, like you know how, what a ping pong ball feels like? That was my brain. I'm like, it'd be a few weeks, whatever, like, and he doesn't respond. And within 10 seconds, Erica texts me. And Erica says, YP. Hold off on the meat eater stuff like uh, let's talk Monday or something. And I'm like, oh my, I'm like, fuck. Like, I'm like, I'm getting canned for asking to do, like, I don't know, dude. Like, I'm like, what do you mean we'll talk Monday? This was a Friday. That's a long weekend. Like, the whole weekend I'm sitting there, like, and, you know, I'm like, I had a lot of processes in my brain this entire time. And we'll get into that in a second. But I definitely wasn't as mature, and I had a lot of things that I definitely had to do some self-work on that I have since then. We'll get into it. That's the happy part. But I was tweaking, dude. Like the whole weekend, losing my mind. I'm like, oh my god, I'm gonna, I'm like, I'm gonna get fired for asking to do hunting stuff. Like, I'm, this is crazy. I was so scared. I'm like, all this stuff. Go Monday. And I have the call with Erica, and I'm like, hey Erica, like, how's it going? And she answers, and I'm like, like shaking, right? Like I'm thinking I'm about to get canned. Erica's like, what's up, YP? Like, you know, like she's always like fired up when you talk to her. She's like, okay. YP, we're gonna make the meat eater stuff happen, like all good. Um, we need to get you like a new contract. And I'm like, it'd be like the whole weekend I was like emotionally in the gallows, like waiting for the thing to drop down and cut my head off. All of a sudden I'm like, not only they take the gallows away, I'm like, what? Like, I'm like, what's going on? She's like, we'll talk tomorrow. And I'm like ecstatic, relieved again, right? Like this whole up and down, which once again, something I was very unregulated with my highs and lows of emotionally like that. Like, okay, so we're gonna do this stuff tomorrow. She's like, we'll talk again tomorrow. I'm like, okay. We go talk the next day. She's like, YP, we wanna bet big on you. We're, you're gonna have a, we're gonna do a four year deal. I'm like, oh, what? Like, um, you know what I mean? I'm like, I never even had a contract. When I got the job at Barstool, I remember I was in Dave's office. He was like putting something in his briefcase and I like walked in. I'm like, hey, he's like looking for something. Probably his old laptop that used to like fall apart when he's like opening it. And I was like, hey, like, is this much okay? And he's like, yeah, like not even looking. I was like, oh, if I start on January 16th, is that cool? He's like, sure. And then I just walked out. Like that was my like deal, like negotiation. All of a sudden I'm like a four year deal. Like I'm feeling like I'm like, you know, like Pat Mahomes or something. I'm like four years, dude. I was like 28 years old. Or that. I'm like, dude, like four years might as well have been 40 years. I'm like, I'm feeling like I'm a franchise player. Like it was amazing, right? Like I'm like, years this is and you got to remember this was my favorite I read the site all day every day for almost a decade before I worked there then I'm grinding doing soul scenes then I get to do bar saw doors now they're like we want to give you a four-year deal brother I couldn't have been I was like a kid in a candy store the next day she says okay they send me the offer Bro, I'm getting paid to play with sharks and snakes. You think I was gonna go back in? And granted, I didn't have an agent. Like everyone, not, like people have agents and negotiate. I, I should have had one, I'm an idiot. And I'm also terrible at negotiating. One of my buddies last summer was signing with the Blues and he was, they were doing all this stuff. I'm like, bro, just take it, man. Like 70 million still a lot of money, like fuck it. And then he's like, dude, my agents say like I can get more than that. I'm like, dude, like just take it. You don't want him to pull a deal. And his agents end up getting him like 10 more million. <laughs> it's like, if you listen to me, this has got to be in the poorhouse. Anyways, so she says, call me back in two days. Like, you know, here's the deal. Like, look it over. I called her back two days later. I didn't ask for a single more dollar. I didn't ask, like, I don't care, dude. 
I'm getting paid to work at my favorite place, playing with sharks and doing my outdoor show for four more years. I'm like, you could have said it was zero dollars, which is also, like I said, I'm a bad negotiator. That's not negotiating, being like, I'd do it for free. But I would have done it for free. I don't care. Whatever this deal was, I was, I was so, I'm, I'm engaged to the girl of my dreams. I got a four-year deal. And I called her back. I was like, I didn't ask for another dollar, nothing. All that I said, I'm like, I want to try to get Bar Saw Doors to Netflix, like all this. I was like so fired up. And that was my, I didn't care about money. I didn't care about anything else. I wanted the resources to build it up. And I was like, we, I think if we can take this to like streaming, because always to me, there's all sorts of great Barso content. Like they, there was all sorts of talented people there, like better than me, all this different stuff. But to me, Barso Outdoors, the way that I had constructed it from the beginning, I'm like, I think this could be a long form 24 minute show that goes on Hulu or Netflix or something eventually. And I said that in the thing, I'm like, I really think that in this four years, we can make that happen. Because to me, if you get on Netflix, you get on Hulu. We were at like nine, eight, 900,000 then. I'm like, dude, that's how we take this to like 5 million. Like that's how Bar Slot Doors becomes the biggest thing. Like look at Meat Eater, they were on Netflix. I'm like, this is how we get that to that next level. So I'll never forget, I signed the deal. So Friday the 13th in this November, it was Friday the 13th. So I signed it Thursday. I'm like, Erica, cause you know, I'm like, once again, I got a little bit stuff weird up here. I'm like, I can't sign this contract on Friday the 13th. Cause like, I don't know, it just felt like bad mojo, which given what happened next, I probably should have signed it on Friday the 13th. I don't know, dude. Maybe they processed it on the 13th because let me tell you what, brother, it was not, whatever good luck I was trying to get was not going. So I remember that night, we went to this place in St. Louis called Pepe's Number Two. Dude, I'm at dinner. I'm with me and my beautiful fiance. We're like having my best friend in the world. We're eating. You ever seen like the Justin Bieber like yummy music video? Dude, like when they got all the plates and everything, like dude, I'm ordering. 17 different kinds of pasta. I'll take the veal, I'll take the chicken. I'm like, there's two of us. Like we probably had enough food to, to feed a city. And I'll never forget, I wrote this thing. I'm like, I have this journal entry. I'm like, my life is set. Like everything's perfect, all this stuff. So next thing you know, the first part of this meat eater series with me and Steve is um, in Montana trapping beavers. And it was the week before Thanksgiving which I was supposed to go to the office before and then we decided against it last minute because it was like COVID was flaring up and like I was like, I don't want to get sick before. And like, in retrospect, I think a lot of things would have changed if I had gone that week before, like just being in the office because that was the big thing at the time was like from when I got engaged in Montana and all the, the chatter, what, where's YP? We don't even know where he is. He's in the Himalayas. I really wish, obviously, I had gone to the office that week before, but at the time, I just signed a four-year contract I'm going to do this giant shoot in Montana with Steve Ranella of Meat Eater. I'm like, I'm doing, like, I didn't want to get sick and then have to miss the shoot, like, all this stuff. So I was like, I don't know. So we canceled that trip. Obviously, in retrospect, wish I had gone to that. Go to do the shoot in Montana. The coolest thing of all time. I meet Steve. We do their podcast. I'm, like, riding around in the truck with Steve. His truck, like, to this shoot, like, an hour and a half. Just me and Steve Rinella in the car, like talking for like, it was cr each way. Like, and there's like, I remember this bald eagle was like picking apart a carcass on the side of the road. He's like spotting like elk and stuff. Like it was like everything you would think like driving around Montana with Steve Rinella was like, he's like, oh yeah, that's a mule deer. That's it. like, it was like, it was like the animals were like coming out in front of him. Like it's like somehow this guy's like, this guy had juice like I'd never seen. He's like, Joe Rogan's like calling him while we're in the car. So I'm like, dude, this guy is on a different level. So anyways. We go to do it, we, the shoot goes great, and like, it was so cool filming with Steve, intimidating but cool. And then, the night before Thanksgiving 2020, he invited him and his wife, who, his wife, for people that don't know, she was the CEO of Meat Eater now, I don't know what she, but she's like a genius, like she's like a really successful, smart businesswoman herself. So, her and Steve are like the craziest, like the power couple of the century with that kind of, like she's this business stud, He's this like outdoors legend, like they're pretty cool together. And they invited me and my fiance over to their house for like the night before, th like the Wednesday night Thanksgiving, before Thanksgiving dinner. And I go over there and like, dude, they have their kids, like Renell's kids, Steve and Katie are like, they're like out of the catalog of like smart, like they're good at everything. Like his son was like making fun of me. He's like, oh, like 
look at this shot I put on a deer from like 200 yards. Like this guy, this little kid's like chirping me. I'm like, dude, like, don't make me look bad in front of your dad, dude. Like their kids are like the coolest kids in the world. And I'm like wrestling with them. Like we end up eating this dinner, of course, that Steve had like shot himself and like, you know, halibut from Alaska from their fish shack. And like, it was like out of a movie once again. And I remember this night so vividly because it was the last like normal night of my life, right? Like at this point, which it wasn't normal. It was the coolest thing of all time. But then they put the kids to bed. I'm sitting there. It's me, my fiance, Steve and Katie. We're like drinking wine, talking. I'm like, at that moment, if I could say when my life had like peaked, like hopefully it's, it's been good again and hopefully it goes back up. But in that time, it was straight out of a feature film. Like if Ben Freeman like could have like scripted how things gone, it was unbelievable. And that's important because of anyone who filed bars or whatever, Black Friday is the day after Thanksgiving. So we woke up like 4 a.m., flew back, we went to Missouri. Of course, COVID like sucked that year and like I couldn't even see my grandparents or Thanksgiving like because of COVID, like it was so lame, like I wasn't even with, and I remember I'm just gas, right? Like, like we're woke up at four, you fly back, it's on Thanksgiving day, I'm meeting all stuff, but everyone at Barcel knows like, Black Friday starts Thursday night at midnight, right? Or more like 11, because I'm in Central. So I remember I tweeted a few of the links and I had put it on the Instagram story. Was it a thousand times? No, I wish it was looking back, right? Wake up Friday. I know I had done it a few times on outdoors, on my account, on whatever. And I, I guess I hadn't tweeted and Instagrammed enough. I had done it sometimes, I know for a fact, because like when you get burnt to the coals, you definitely go back and look, I did it but I guess it wasn't enough or on the lower end. And I see Dave start tweeting, YP's value's never been lower, you know, like um, all this stuff. And he texts me like, fuck you, you know, whatever, like whatever he was, he's like, on, and, and like, there's no excuse. Like when Dave texts you, like whatever you're doing is not enough. Like it's like a coach on a team. Like my dad would tell me growing up, it's like, it, whatever the coach says is like, that's what it is. Like if you didn't get the puck deep enough, then you should, gotta get it through the boards next time. Like he's my boss, you know what I mean? So he texts me, he's like unacceptable, whatever. And like, I know with Dave, like once he thinks something like that, like, what am I going to do? Be like, oh, actually I Instagram two times or three times. It's like, I just said unacceptable, like we'll do more. And I started tweeting a thousand times and it was bad. Like it was, you know, obviously my head's pulsing. Like anyone who's ever had Dave mad at them in Barcelona, outside tweeting at you, all the stuff. And I tweeted him back or I texted him back, unacceptable, you know, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Like, I'm sorry. Like I'm going to do it right now. Like whatever, just what do you say to a boss? Like, oh, I and he just texted back like, fuck you. <laughs> like, and I was like, oh damn. Like however bad you thought it was, it's like, oh, it's worse than that. Then he tweets the text of like us. And I'm like, like I'm laughing now, but I wasn't laughing then. Like I'm laughing as like how someone talks about like, oh, and then like, you know, the plane crashed. It's like, dude, this is like the worst moments in my life, right? Then. I was tweeting all these things about, oh, you know, like buy this, buy this, so I don't get murdered, all this stuff. And then at this point, I see a tweet go up from Dave's account. It's like an old fashioned like poster. Like I've, I've literally not seen it since that day because it gave me like EVG was like, wanted new head of Barcelona outdoors. I'm like, dude, like it was almost like I got hit with like, you know, in uh, what's the movie, Old School, where Will Ferrell gets hit with the dart and he's like, you're funny, man. Like he falls in the pool and he's like, like that's like it's like I was in slow I'm like what like a shockwave I'm like what like and granted looking back like should I have like I don't know the, the way I handled it and the way it affected me is insane now as like a different person right but I'm like oh my god this is crazy and I'm thinking to myself dude you just signed a four-year contract like last week like come on he's he's messing with in like you got to know with Barstow like Dave and Gaz and those guys it's like Sometimes stuff is like to get your goat or to rally you up and you don't know when it's real always versus content. Like I didn't know in that moment. I'm like, what's going on? New head of Barcelona doors. I'm like, I literally just got back from filming with Steve Rinella yesterday and just got a four year contract. Like to me, I thought I was doing like really good. And we just, season three was like done filming. I'm like, I'm like, wow. Like I thought we were like kind of crushing it. And also in my mind, the way I was thinking of it, I'm like, we're making more on these sponsors of the show then I'm getting paid like and we're growing and all this stuff like to me like I was like okay I'm doing my job like I'm you know what I mean and I'll never forget that day it was like it was like my brain was refreshing every like five minutes like it's just like like you almost are like in shock like I'm like 
I'd like keep remembering that that just happened. So the, with the series with Ranella, the second shoot with Ranella was the next week, and I was leaving on that Monday. So I was like, okay, weekends suck, but I'm like, I'm going to film this stuff with Steve, just like head down, get it done, and like should have tweeted more. Like I didn't know, right? And I didn't know what was real and what was fake, and like obviously, like just rattled would like not even to begin to describe it but like um at that point i'm like i'm going to film with ranella just crush this season three comes out like it'll be fine and that next week like his podcast or whatever came out and like i remember him being like whatever he said on it which i couldn't even listen to at the time like i'd have my fiance listen to it and like tell me what it's because i was so I was absolutely had terrible processes and ways of handling things. That's all my fault. And like, I've now gone to extensive amounts of therapy and different things to correct. You know what I'm saying? But basically the way I would, the way I would describe my, a kind of like my life and my men mental frame at that time was like, like a house of cards can look beautiful, right? And be tall and intricate and look great. But an earthquake or a gust of wind comes by and it goes down really fast. But when conditions are perfect, it's great, right? Like it can stand forever. My ability to handle things at the time was a lot like that. So when this started going, oh my God, I was, I was like withdrew and I'm, I'm not sleeping. I'm like puking. I'm like so rattled. The anxiety's crazy. And I'm like, I literally was losing my mind. So then when he says on the podcast the next week, like, oh, YP didn't build bar slot doors or whatever he started. And like at this point, I'm like, oh my God. I gotta say something. And I, I, I was like, and I, you never know at Barstool what's content and what's like, he's really like gonna, you know, hire someone out. Like, I didn't really know at the time. Like, I don't know. And with Dave, some of his biggest, like some of the people there that were the most like legitimate would like go war, you know, like head to head with him and argue back and all this stuff. And I didn't know him. Like, is that what he wants? Like, I don't know, right? Like, I'm just spinning, just like, like, you know when you get hit with like the shell in Mario Kart and you're like, that was kind of like just me, I'm like, what's going on? So then I made this video, I'm going up to film with Ranella and I'm on the side of the road, I'm like, and it's on my Instagram and the IGTV thing, like people can go watch, but I'm like, I built bar slot doors, kind of everything I was saying before. I'm like, this was my life's dream. I like worked my ass off to build it, all this stuff to say I didn't, like just kind of stating facts, whatever. And in my mind, I'm like, Cause like, remember the call her daddy stuff? Like, not that I'm Alex Cooper, but all that drama just made them even way bigger, right? So I'm like, okay, maybe if I like go at it with them, like this is gonna be a bigger thing. I don't know. Like, I don't really know. I was just like trying to make a play at the time. Put the video out the next day and I'm with Ronello, we're hunting. And like, dude, <laughs> Dave is like a grizzly bear, dude. Like, it's like, you either play dead or like, I thought maybe if I like try to like hit the bear back, I don't know. <laughs> it did not work. Like. It made him so much more mad. He's like, bottom. like it's like the bear. I'm like playing dead and then I'm like, all right, maybe he just wants me to hit him and he'll leave. And I hit him and he just like fucking gored me. And I'm like, oh shit, I didn't mean to hit you. So then I made that video. And like at the end of the day, did that video lead Dave to want to murder me more or something? You could say maybe, whatever. At the same time, even though the results weren't great overall, long term, I am proud that I like not went out on my sword, but like I made that video, I kind of took my nuts in my hand. Like, was I terrified? Was I like, didn't like really know? But like, I was like, all right, yeah. Like I had been so fucking afraid of my shadow there the entire time. Then I had this like uprising in 2019. I'm like, now I'm this guy, I thought I was cool, but I had never fully shaken. Like, like even then, like when Dave's saying all that, it was the first time I'd ever like, spoken up for myself and been like, you know what, dude, I worked my ass off building this. I came into this office in 2016 and said, I want to be your bar saw doors guy. Something that never existed and probably not, I'm not trying to be like, like, like make something more than it is, but odds, like there's a good chance there would never be a bar slot doors or that entire vertical or old row outdoors or all these things that spawned off of it afterwards. If I never walked into that office and said, I want to do bar slot doors. And not only that, if I had just said that and then like disappeared and done stool scenes, this meant the world to me. And I worked harder than I've ever worked on anything in my life to make it a reality. And I'm very proud that even if, um, if shit had hit the fan and like, obviously that video, I don't think made Dave happy, but you know what? At least I said the truth and what I thought. And I said, you know what, dude? I did build this. I did this. I give a fuck about it. I care. Like all this stuff. So I make the video. 
And dude, going to war with Dave on the internet, a fate. Oh man, like I think there's probably more countries in the world that have like survived going to war with the United States than like people who have survived going to war with Dave on the internet. It don't, it don't end pretty many times. Like I remember we were filming with Ronella and one, so Chernin owned Meat Eater at the time. I don't know if they still do, maybe. But before Barstool got sold to Penn, the sports book that they're sold to now, Chernin bought Barstool and Chernin owned Meat Eater. So one of the people, I was with Ronella and like Steve wanted to make a video at the time like chirping Dave, like not chirping Dave, but like making fun of the situation because I was, dude, I like didn't eat for two days. I was like puking upstairs. I had diarrhea. Like I was a mess, dude. In this hunting lodge should have been like literally the value of that experience, like going on this hunting thing with Steve Rinella is like probably one of the coolest things in the entire world. And I'm like upstairs, like puking, like having diarrhea, like, I'd, like go to the stand with him in the morning, then go back, like just be like, like shooting my brains out. Like, dude, I was like in a torture chamber and Steve was like, you are right, dude. Like, I'm like glad that I was with Steve and, and all those guys that were there, like Seth and all these, like, they were like so cool to me and John Kelly and like, but everyone knew like, I'm going through it, dude. Like when you're at war with Dave, there's not a lot of relaxing or like fun stuff. It's not like I can be like, eh, hey, man, I'll check my phone later. Like I'm, I'm like hooked up to the IV, like getting the shit. And it was so much, so much, let me say this first. The amount of people that had my back, I'm unbelievably grateful. I have a screen recording on my old phone of like hundreds of texts of my friends and people that were like, we have your back, we're so proud. Like it, it, it really is meant the world. So I'm not trying to um, only focus on the negative, right? Cause like so many people have my back and I'm so grateful for that because that's when it matters, right? At the same time, the amount of like hate when you go to war with Dave or you're at odds with him, right? Oh my God, it's, it is like, I think I almost even forget now the level, like it's this constant panic. Now, 20, 2023, Ben, right now, would I have been as affected by it as I was then? I would like to say no, because I'm in a different headspace. But then, like I told you, I was in this kind of house of cards, like fragile mentality, where it's like, when that was happening, like the world was over. My entire personality was from this like external, not personality, but this validation was all from an external source, right? So even when it was coming like in positive in some areas, all the hate and the toxic stuff and the constant DMs like kill yourself, you lazy piece of shit, like like kill yourself, you just you have your dream job and you're pussy, like all like it's just it's every second, like dude, the screenshots are insane. Like some people are like, I'm gonna shoot you. Like I literally have death threat DMs all my life. And I'm like sitting there, and it's like that affected me a lot of the time. The other thing too I wanna say about because this leads to like, this is kind of the, of me leaving Barstool is like, when you're in Barstool, right? You are hyper online. Like we would sit there, we're on Twitter all day, every day, refreshing it. Instagram, like TikTok, that was like big at that time, like kind of taken off. And I was, you're seeing everything, right? Like now, which we'll get into that, but like, I don't even go, I haven't gone on Twitter in like a month right now. Like I don't see this stuff. People send me, so I don't even see it till a month later. And you don't even care at that point. At the time, it's like an IV to like your eyeballs, right? Like I was seeing every tweet, every DM, everything. And even when people are saying positive stuff, like if you're getting 300 tweets in a day, like you lazy piece of shit, like you're fucking worthless. Like I was so affected by it way more than I should have been. And some people might've been able to work at Barcel and have that happen and be fine with it. Right? So I'm not saying this is Barcel's fault or Dave's fault or anything, but the way that I was kind of set up at the time in my head, it affected me a lot, right? And I was really, really in a bad place. So I come back from that shoot, crazy, sh it sucks that that footage will never come out, but it was really cool. Steve Rinella, like we took, I think we filmed for like four days or something. It was like unbelievable, right? I was like living in a meat eater episode, like with Steve, like tracking blood track. It was so cool. <laughs> the footage that maybe, I don't know, maybe someday, but anyways, and shout out to Steve for all of his time that he's like, I'll never get those days back. But anyways, we had fun. He had fun. I don't think I had that much fun because I was in torture chamber. I come back, I go back down to Florida for like around like where Christmas and everything after this whole thing in December. And dude, I was like, Dave went on his podcast like again. I remember after he did a whole episode like of like re responding to my video. And like I remember Dave tweeted, he's like, bad news for YP, like I woke up or something. I'm like, now it's funny, right? Like it's funny, but at the time I'm like, like, dude, it's crazy, right? 
I made the video, do the shoe with Renella, I go back down, dude, I'm a basket case at this point. Like, walking around in the woods by myself, like everyone's calling me I've ever known, like, what's going on? Is it for content? Is it WWE? I'm like, I don't know. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know what's going on. And at the end of that year, I like, I made a post like, oh, I'm going off social media, which like, dude, why do people do that? Why did I do that? Like, dude, just go off social media. Why did I make that post? So weird. I think it was like a cry for help because I was like so rattled at like every day people being like, kill yourself, you lazy piece of shit. That it's like, I don't know why. But then, and I still was posting Barca Outdoors every day, but I just wasn't going on. Like I would have my fiance do my Twitter on her phone. Like she would look at it. I'd be like, tell me if I need to see something. If not, like I would not look. I wouldn't look at my Instagram, nothing. She had everything on her phone. Like talk about a basket case. I couldn't even have my accounts on my phone because I didn't want to look at it. So I would just do Barca Outdoors, like posting the stuff. And then I was like, okay, go into January of that year. And I thought like, okay, it's going to like die down. I'm going to go back in the office and like, I didn't really know, right? Like there's no playbook. Like the thing about Barcelona and Dave is like, it is the wild west, right? Like there's no playbook of like, this is how long something blows over. Like you never know. And like, could I have like gone into the office then and like just like lived in the office or done some like gesture to try to like, I don't know, like clearly whatever, like I should have done something different in, in regards to that. But this sounds pathetic, but I was so like, just shot in my head. Like, I'm like, I was so not a real person at this point. I'm like, what's gonna happen? I just signed this deal, I'm on this high. And all of a sudden I'm like, I don't know what they can do, all this stuff. So I go to go back into the office. I remember when I went to go back into the office, there was a podcast that came out like that day. Cause I remember I saw the kid like editing it. Like, it's like watching someone like mix the chemicals for your own execution. But like, I'm not gonna ask him like, yo bro, don't put so much chemicals in that. Like I can't, cause then he would have told Dave and he's like, put more chemicals. Like, so I was watching the kid and he put out the podcast that day. And like I told you, I couldn't, I was so like fragile. My brain was like just a house of cards that had collapsed and been put in a wood chipper. Like I was like, and like people could see when I went in the office that week, like, and dude, like I wasn't on anything. People would be like, oh, he's on Dude, I was literally just like, that's the funniest things. Like I just was so anxious and like, just like neurotic with the stuff. Like I could barely function, right? Like it was like every tweet, everything. And I remember my fiance told me like, she's like, it's bad. I'm like, fuck really? And she's like, yeah, it's really bad. Like I go back to the thing and David said like, on the podcast, Dave had said, like, YP doesn't, you know, run Bar Soft Doors anymore. Like, and he texted me or I said some email. I'm like, hey, can I come to Detroit instead? Because I wanted to just take my medicine from him, take my lumps, have him berate me or whatever was going to happen. I didn't know it was going to happen. He's like, you're not welcome here. You have no more travel, you know, approved until I say so. And, um, and at this time, I didn't really know. I had never been to therapy. I'd never been to anything, right? Like I'm flying blind with a lot of this stuff. And um, during that time at the beginning of January and December and all that stuff, I would sit in my bed. Like I wouldn't go out until like midnight to three. I'd like walk outside to get, like I was so afraid because there was people like during all this barrage of like toxic hate and stuff like on DMs and comments. Cause when you go to war with Dave, it's not just Dave, he is a, billion people that are his like loyal fans. It made me so paranoid and neurotic. Now, looking back, it's like, bro, it's Barcel sports. Like, it's not like I had like murdered someone and was on the run. Like in my head at that time, it's like, you get so wrapped up in that world and everything that it's like, to me, I was like, like, I didn't know, like I thought at any moment someone was gonna pop out from a palm tree and be like, look Dave, like he's not, and like two, like one person sent a picture was like, this guy, like I saw you walking on US one, like not working, huh? And like, and I was so paranoid that like at any second, I was like, I had one moment, like this panic attack. I was in mangrove mics and with my whole family, my fiance, everyone. And I just was like, there was these kids, these college kids sitting behind me. And like, when you work at Barcel, you kind of have this meter of like, who's gonna recognize you when it's like a white 24 year old dude that's like wearing like a frat shirt. You're like, this guy might say what's up. And I was like, and then I just walked out of the, it's like funny now, but it's, it's ridiculous. I was a shell of a person. And I walked out, I was walking down by like the, um, by Lorelei on the back road. I remember like my fiance came out, she's like, what's wrong? I'm like, dude, like, I don't know. Like, I can't even be in there right now. It was so pathetic. Like it was bad, right? Like my head was just gone. And it's like, when this podcast comes out, 
he said something about like YP is a brand new employee. Like he doesn't um, work at Barcelona Outdoors. Like we we hired someone else. All this stuff, which like, dude, I didn't know what was true and what's not. And um, then he said like YP is just gonna come in the office and blog like a brand new employee. Like I kind of figured out. First of all, I call. Him, I'm like, dude, like. Can, like what's going on here like I'm like I just signed a four-year deal like what do you mean and he's like oh it's like guaranteed like unless you like commit a felony or whatever you know what I mean he's like I don't he's like you can't like get fired but like they could also like I, I remember in the language it's like YP does bars outdoors or whatever you know you're subject to whatever your boss says like they can change it it would be like if someone signed you to a four-year contract to like play you know running back on a team and then they're like actually we're gonna like a week later like you sign the deal and then they're like you're gonna sit on the bench and be fourth string like punter or something and you're like okay like I'm still on the team and I still would have got paid I guess but I'm like damn like that's not really what I was hoping would happen when this all like a month before transpired of the new contract and I'm doing so good and all this stuff and like in the time after everything that had happened and you know all since I got there it was so personal when I started at Barcel. It was like, it was really a family. Like I was employee 43 when we started, you know what I mean? And like a year before, or like six months before I was employee 43, I think they had 16 people total, right? So this was a small family and that's including everyone, sales, you know, like camera, everything. And the thing that I think my brain just couldn't get over was how personal it used to felt of me sleeping on Erica's couch. And like, she was like my mom, you know, when I first moved there and the people there were like my siblings, right? And I think then devoting my life every single second from when I left St. Louis in 2016 and went to New York and lived there and worked on Barcelona outdoors every second of every day. I think then that momentum and high of like, oh, now you're going to get a four year extension and we're, you know, I wanted to be a lifer, right? Like I thought I was going to be there forever and it meant the world to me building Barcelona outdoors was my soul. And to then so quickly, rapidly from one week to the next be like, you're doing great, we're gonna give you this contract extension to then your value's never been lower and you, you know, we're gonna replace you and all this stuff. It just felt so like foreign and dirty and like hurt me in a way that it was like my brain could never get over it, which is not their fault. Like, and I'm also not a victim. Like there's a million things I could have done differently or, you know, little forks in the road that would have turned things out differently. Completely, hindsight's obviously 2020. But once it got to that juncture, it was tough for me to go back mentally. I, I really like, it just crossed my wires for whatever reason. Barcelona is an unbelievable place to grow and learn. And the, the, if you want to be in content, like, dude, I could have never learned as much as I did at Barcelona, right? In a thousand different ways. Every spectrum, watching Dave every day, I just learned. But for me at that point, right? I wanted to kind of be in this new chapter of my life. It just felt really like, to me after everything that had gone on and how hard I had worked to like become that, I was like, man, I don't know what's gonna happen. And maybe Dave would have made me do something for two weeks and then it would have back, been back to normal. What's the kind of thing? I guess we'll never know. I don't know. But like all I'm saying is like, I loved working at Barca more than anything. I signed a four year deal with the hopes of being there for. That would have been eight years at that point, and who knows? I never had the plans to leave, but I had had the thought in my head. I always knew that I wanted to start my own thing. I didn't know where it was going as far as like, am I gonna be made to be this like pledge thing or whatever where I'm like getting like, you know, someone coffee every day, like whatever. I didn't know what was about to happen. The biggest thing by far, and this is by no means like something I'm like, like, cocky or like excited to tell people but like I was in such a broken and just just unhealthy place mentally in a lot of ways and like really like not like oh I'm sad for a few days like without getting too dark like I was in a bad place mentally right and um I just needed it to stop and um I, I was crying bawling when I called Erica I almost couldn't believe it, right? Like this is a month after I just signed a four year deal. I'm the happiest kid in the world, I loved it. All of a sudden, I, I don't know, it was surreal. And I'll never forget, there was the craziest snowstorm in January, end of January 2020, 2021. And I called Eric, I was like looking at the thing and I'm bawling. It's like really sad. I was like, Eric, I was like, 
basically in so many words, I'm like, I need this to stop. I need us to find a way that I can get out of this contract. I was like, Erica, I'm, I'm in a really bad place and I, ne I need out. I'm sorry. I was like, I love you. I love Barcel. This has been the most fun time of my entire life. And I mean that. I never had more fun. It was, it was unbelievable. But in that moment, could I, could I have gone back or done this X's and O's way? Yeah, I'm sure. But like literally it wasn't an option, which is sad. I'm not proud to say that, but that's where I was. And I didn't leave with some, it's not like I was like, and I had, like people were reaching out. Oh, come work here. Come do this. I never, it was nothing about that, which is like, pretty dumb when you leave a job you shouldn't just like have no plan I had no plan I just was like so and like I said it's embarrassing now right like that's not like a way and like now I'm a different person I've grown from this but I was like I need it to stop so I officially tell Erica and she tells me okay call me she was like all right listen YP take a couple days think it over like you know she's like she was so nice and like was like YP like she was in that moment man like I I was broken and I'm calling her and she was like being very receptive. She's like, take a breath, take a couple days. Tell me how you feel then. I'm like, okay, fly down to Florida. Me and my fiance just, we, we just got a place there because I knew I was leaving at that point. And I told Erica two days later, I'm like, I was like, Erica, I love my time there. I love you. I'm so grateful. Thank you so much. But I was like, I want to proceed like leaving, you know? And it was so weird because I'm like, what is life outside? You know, like I didn't have, before I went there, I'm living in my parents' basement as like a not even, like I was like a little gremlin, like watching movies at night and like filming music videos. Now I'm like an engaged 28 year old dude, 29 year old guy, like what am I doing? You know what I'm saying? Like it was very scary and I didn't know what to do. Okay, so you left Barstool. There's still a lot of time unaccounted for here. Where did you go next? What did you do? Where were you at then? I leave there. And I'm in West Palm and um, I was absolutely a shell of a person at that point, right? Like my entire identity and everything I was proud about, like, you know, who I was as a person, which I know now is, is, is not the way that you should operate. I was so just like beaten mentally. Like I had no juice, no nothing. I'm just like, I'd sit in bed all day. Like I'd just be like, I didn't know what to do, right? Because my only dream, like my only thing was like, I'm gonna make this show, I'm gonna do this. And then I, it happened and everything was so unbelievable the way that it transpired. And now it just felt like, and it was just vanished so fast from my fingertips, right? And I'm like, some people would say, oh, well go start your thing. And like, and I knew, you know, okay, I'm gonna start my own thing. Like that was the, that was the party line at that point. But to be straight up with you, I didn't, I was like, I may never make a video again. Like, I was like, I might go become like a lumberjack, like Dexter and that, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, if you had been, if I had been made content outside of it beforehand, I'm sure I would have been fine to leave at the time. Everything that I had ever like taken satisfaction of like, look, I'm this person came from this world. So all of a sudden I'm out of it. And not only that, when you go to war with Dave and then leave, it's like every, still incessant at this time worthless piece of shit like also and it's like dude now honestly i was just in this deep kind of like depression and just like i, I had no goals no excitement no nothing I, I was so i literally felt zero ambition to ever do anything again i didn't care what happened to me i'm like i just wake up and i just be like existing like i was just there right now i know that's a little dramatic right like i still am the same person i know how to do this stuff but at that time, I'm thinking this was my whole life's work was creating this thing and it's gone. And I remember one day when I literally like had thought probably some of the darkest thoughts of my life. And I remember I went to the zoo because I was trying to just find any sort of inspiration of like being alive. Like I'm like, I love animals. Like, and I know this is dark. I'm not trying to bring everyone down, but it was bad, man, bad. And I went to the zoo and I was like looking at the animals and I'm like kind of trying to like be like, dude, don't do something, you know, really bad. Like, remember this kid that loved animals and all these things? Like, I was trying to, like, find something. I was a shell. I was existing. Like, you ever seen, like, a, uh, like a tumbleweed? Like, I was just existing. And I thought it was bad. So your life has officially cratered, is a smoking pile of ashes, and gone off the rails. Could it have gotten any worse? Oh, man. 
when my engagement ended, it was um, just a pain that I never knew, like a feel, a, a pain that I, a feeling I never could knew existed on this earth. Like anything in my entire life before that, I was shocked, hurt, like confused, um, just sad, just in just in the deepest pain, and just uh, whatever I was before a shell. Now I was like. You ever see like people, this might be a niche reference, but like if you leave a shrimp in like a shrimp bucket and like you you think you got them all out, but then there's like one and it like gets dried out in the sun. It's like whatever's less than a shell, like the little like white part that's like the film of the shell, like that's what I was at this point. Just, I was like biological matter, but I wasn't a human. And it was so, so, so bad because it's just a loss in so many different ways. Like. You lose your best friend off the top. You lose your best friend in the entire world that like the other half of your brain, you know, like every memory, every thought, every single thing that you thought, it's like this person who your brain is connected to is all of a sudden just like the cord is out and you're just gone. That's off the top. You lose all of your shared places and songs and your friends. Like I miss her friends all the time. Like I, I was like out of nowhere, you know, like you're like, this life that you're building together that meant so much, right? Like, and um, you lose their family, you lose like everything that was special together for you guys, the shows that you watched, inside jokes, it's just gone in an instant. And um, the biggest thing to me is like, I think what I think what murdered me the most was losing like the future, right? Like it's not just in that moment and your best friend and all the, cosmetic fun parts of like when you love someone. This is someone who I loved more than life and wanted to be my wife and I, I had every indication thinking this is what was gonna happen. And it felt like I had lost like 70 years with someone, you know what I'm saying? Or however long, you know, like you live together. It's like, I was so excited to be a husband and to get married to her and like, bro, when I said that I wanna spend my rest of my life with that person, I meant every letter of it. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like that's a, that's something that you just swap out. Like, no, I wanted it with that person and I loved her with everything in my body. So it killed me. You know, it really, really killed me because on top of everything else, you know, I was so excited to be a husband and be her husband and like to be a dad, like it meant the world to me and it still does, you know, I, I'm, I'm excited when that happens someday, but it felt like it was so close and every indication I, you know, thought was that that was coming in, in, in the near future. And it's gonna make me emotional, but it just kills me, you know, like I, I was so excited to like take our son, like, you know, to hockey practice or like take my daughter out in the ocean and be like, look at these sharks and like, look at all this like beautiful coral and like, kills me man like i i had pictured you know like our kid our cute little kids like i'm like dude i could see our little kids like running around in the kitchen and us like playing songs and them like dancing like you know what i mean like it was so real to me and when that just vanished out of nowhere and evaporated it's like oh man the good news was i completely forgot about everything with barso like instantly <laughs> it's like if there's one silver lining I was cured of all sadness of like, oh, Barcelona Outdoors is just whoop, like out of your like grasp. I didn't even remember I'd worked for Barcelona at that point. Like, dude, I'm like, I was so fucked up, man. Like, and it's pathetic, right? Like if you thought I was, dude, all of, and I realize this now, right? So I had a million amazing things have come from this incredibly painful situation. Me leaving Barcelona and my engagement ending, that entire hot streak run, by far the worst, most painful thing in my life, but by far the best thing that ever happened to me, if that makes any sense. I know that sounds like I'm like some sort of like speaker that's full of shit, but like. I think that process of truly becoming independent and, and truly being self-sufficient, the end result and like the dad or the husband I can be now is like, I'm so proud of that work and the way that it kind of like was not where I thought it was going to go at this time. I never meant to do that on purpose, but I'm really proud of that. Like a silver lining of everything that happened, not even a silver lining, like the best outcome of all of that is that no matter how we got there, I'm in a 50,000 times better place 
in every type of like relationship and situation mentally in my life. And I'm super grateful for that. It caused a personal development and growth. Like when you get a rock bottom, right? Like you really are done. It causes you to grow. You, you can listen. I was in a dark place before, but at least I had my best friend who I was like loved more than life. Now I had nothing, dude. And you really get to this point. It's like, you can give up. And I thought about it. Like, I'm not trying to laugh and be dark, but um, it was bad, man. I'd just be sobbing in the shower. Like, dude, by myself. It's one thing when you're sad in front of people or like you tell your boys, whatever. I was fucked up in a way that was like not a healthy, normal thing. And I, I just would try to get myself. And I was going to so much therapy. And honestly, like Pat Maroon, Loki, and, and Fran, his wife, like, not saved my life, but Pat was like, dude, come to Tampa and like, you know, come stay with me. Because he knew I was in a bad place. And, and Fran, probably even like as much or more than Pat, was like just there talking to me all the stuff. Shout out to probably my favorite person in the world, Freaky Petey, who literally like, I can't even begin to talk about how much this guy like helped a literally keep me alive. I had a lot of people that helped me and I'm grateful for, but like as a person, I was a completely vulnerable, bad thing. And I would think about stuff like it almost gets practical at that point, which is so dark to say, but I was thinking about that kind of stuff in the most realistic of terms, which I don't even know if I should be saying this, but that's the truth. And, um, Luckily, I'm, I've never, like, I've never even smoked weed in my life, so I'm not, like, a drugs person or an alcohol person or, like, luckily, I didn't, like, hurt myself in any ways of, like, consumption or things, but, like, I would just walk. Like, I'd just go in the swamps of Florida by myself, this place west of West Palm in these swamps, and I would just walk, like, 12 miles, and I'd just be, like, by myself, just, like, replaying the events and trying to go back in time. And when you're in this state, right, like, everyone's trying to tell you stuff. People will be trying to say stuff to you. Oh man, it's better now than if you're married or like dodged a bullet, all this stuff. And I'm like, no, like I'm like, dude, I don't agree with that at all. Like, I love that person more than life. Like, I would have, if they, like I would have taken a bullet. You know what I'm saying? Like, I love that girl. To me, she was the smartest, most passionate, motivated, like fun to be around person in history. So like, all of a sudden you're like trying to like let it go and like let. And I just, I was so just in a tailspin, right? And some of it looking back, some of it's like kind of funny looking back, right? Like I go to, to sell the ring and it's like, you're calling all these places. Like the whole process of selling an engagement ring is, is low key one of the funniest, most niche things of all time because I'm calling these places, right? Like at first when I got it back, I'm like, I'm keeping this like maybe, you know, 10 years. Like I didn't know, like, you know, I'm, like I told you, I was a show. But then like you're sitting there, I paid a billion dollars for it. I'm like, all right, I'm about to get my money. So I'm like, okay. And you go to sell an engagement ring and I'm calling all these places. And this, and this, it's like a symbol of like what I thought was gonna be in our family for generations and our grandkids are gonna have this and all this. So already you're sad, you're like selling this thing. Number two was just like, I used to see it on her finger every day. So you're like watching it and you're like, it's like killing you having it in the room. Like it would even be there and it would kill me. And then the funniest thing is like, I'm calling all these places to try to sell it, all these jewelers, all these places that buy it. And you're like trying to tell them how valuable this thing is and how much meaningful it'd be to someone getting engaged. And you're like, the whole time you wanna like literally drink bleach because you're like, what the fuck? Like this is supposed to be in my family for like a hundred years or whatever. Like, you know what I mean? The whole concept of it. It's like planning your own funeral, selling the engagement ring. And I'm sitting there and it's day after day and I'd have to send pictures of it. And then you don't want to, you're trying to sell it. So you don't want the picture to be ugly. So I'm sending like fire pictures. Oh yeah, that makes it look great. And this is like one year prior was the thing I was like putting all this effort into like, you know what I mean? Crazy. So there's some things looking back, I'm like, now I can see that's kind of like humorous in retrospect if I wasn't like a shell. The problem is when you break up with someone too that you like love so much, at first you're kind of like, oh, like I can't look or do any, like anything with stuff that we used to do or her stuff. I'd be making like off brand playlists that were like all the same like artists of like the playlists we used to listen to, but like just less fire songs. <laughs> I could be like the same person. Like, and I'd be like, going to get like kombucha, but like, cause like all of a sudden I liked kombucha, but like, I want to get the trilogy one. I'd get like the, the off brand kombucha sauce. Like I'm not trying to get 
the exact same stuff because it was too depressing. Like looking back, it's like kind of hilarious now. Like if it was a movie I was watching, it was very funny because like, it's like, bro, it's okay. Like, it's okay that you still like, still lose the glass animals. It's okay. Like you can still listen to the songs. It doesn't mean you got to cry every time. Down bad, dude. It was bad. So everyone would say, oh, where'd you go afterwards? Let me tell you right now. Hand up, like I would like to say, oh, I've had this crazy, I've been in the bat cave and I made this crazy plan, this scheme. Bro, I was so depressed. Like I hated my life so much. I literally would wake up in a successful day. This is gonna sound so dark. I would just try to pass enough time in the day to get to like enough time at night that I could just like house melatonin and like fall asleep enough to just like make it to the next day and not like jump off a bridge. Like I know that's so dramatic, but brother, that's what, that's what we were at. Anyone that's ever hated me in my life or like ex-girlfriends or like commenters that hated me or like anyone that's ever been like, I fucking hate this dude, they were eating at this time. Like these people, like I got great news, I was down bad. Like whatever's worse than down bad, that's what I was. First of all, I lost like 25 pounds. I was walking nonstop, I wouldn't eat. I'd be like randomly puking and like, crying just thinking about this situation and this and and like some people can go through stuff like that and they're fine and they're all credit to you maybe i will if it ever happens to me i don't know but like i would, was not handling it well right and um i was looking at places in like alaska on these islands where i was literally just gonna like go live and take my dog like i have my husky mako who honestly helped me a ton at the time too and I start going through the summer, all this stuff. And like, what do you think? Every person I'd interact with, number one, I was like in hiding in life. Like I didn't want to see anybody because what are people going to say? Oh, how's your fiance? How's Barstool? Like, I'm like, what the fuck? Like, oh, you look great. Oh no, you don't. You've lost 30 pounds and you look disgusting. Like I was literally, all I would do is like go to therapy, try not to jump off a bridge and like walk around in the swamp and with my dog. Like luckily my dog, he was like, now he's this big giant husky, but at the time he was this puppy and he'd just follow me wherever I went. I'd just take Mako and we'd just walk around for 10 miles. And we'd go back to the car and I'd be like, guess what we're doing tomorrow, man? We're gonna go right back. to This dog had to think that the world was just this one trail in the swamp. So anyways, I get a call at the end of the summer. One of these guys that I had filmed with that I knew really well, he's like, dude, you gotta come to California. And I'm like, all right, I need to go somewhere else. I couldn't stay in Florida because every blade of grass reminded me of like, I just lived there with this girl and all this stuff. And I'm like, Florida's my favorite place on earth, but like, dude, I was just shattered, right? And I'm like, I can't, this exit we took one time to get like Jamba Juice, like, you know what I mean? Like I was, I was like in such a bad state. So I'm like, this guy's like, dude, come out here. I have a boat, we can film all this stuff. I'm like, all right, dude. So I go out to California, which I'd been a bunch of times, but I like, I didn't really know and it was different enough. And I'm living in Marina Del Rey, like, which was so cool. Like, I love it, right? And like, I didn't, I'd never been to that part. I've been to like West Hollywood, all this shit, Malibu's uh, State Park before. I was living in Marina Del Rey, right by the Venezuela, which shout out to Rudy Junda, one of my favorite people who came and visited me. He thought it was called the Venezuelan. It's called like the Venezuela. And he was telling all this, yo, we're, we're at the Venezuela. And I'm like, dude, that's not what it's called. Anyways. And honestly, in California, I was doing a little bit better, right? Like, I'm like, okay, and I was filming every day, like a banshee, and all of a sudden, I'm starting to get that itch back. Like, it was so different, and California's so unlike anything I'd ever done. I'd be out, these guys really were taking care of me. We'd go out, we'd film rattlesnake stuff out in the, in the Mojave or near there, all that desert stuff. Then we'd go up by Santa Barbara. Dude, I used to, I was filming Great Whites every single day. Like, I loved California so much, I could go to this one beach every day and see a gray white. Like I'd see the fins, I'd fly the drone, I'd be like out swimming. It was the coolest thing ever. And I'm from Missouri, dude. You tell me that I can wake up and go see a great white every day. I was loving it. And not better, like my therapist, what big things she imparted on me, healing is not linear, right? Which to me, I'm a very anxious person. Like I wanna think like if I do this, this, and this, then I'm like, then I'll be here. It's like, no dude, sometimes you're here, sometimes you're not. And like, dude, it was hilarious. Like I was at, like I had boys out there and I had so much fun, man. Like going out in LA is like a blast, right? Like it was very different. It's like New York, but wild. And I remember I was at Delilah one night, which like 
I'm already probably breaking the rules because you're not supposed to take pictures. You're not supposed to talk about like, the, like I'm already messing up. But the, I was in there and like, we're with these like kind of famous girls, like like beautiful girls, all stuff. And I'm just sitting there talking about my ex. Like I'm just like talking. And all my boys are like, yo, like chill. And I'm like, I remember I'm showing these girls pictures of me and my ex. Like I'm like, look, we're on the mountain. And like I took her up this mountain. I had a private chef. And like I'm showing these girls, like these like famous chicks. And I'm like, like looking back, it's like, bro, what are you doing, dude? Like I was literally like the poster child for like weird guy like you know in the movie like swingers or whatever where the guys like uh the one guy was like shook up like i'm like that we're so, i'll never forget we're sitting in the booth at delilah and this girl's like hey like i'm gonna set you up with my friend like she's great like oh she's really cute she lives right by you like you'll love her all this stuff and she shows me her instagram and this girl's like like she like was the bachelor or something she's like a million followers she's like you're gonna love her like you guys need to go on a date next week and I was like, I remember, like, now it's so, fuck, it's, like, funny. But at the time, I was like, oh, no, like, I can't go out with her. Like, listen, me and my fiance used to watch The Bachelor together. <laughs> like, I'm like, that was one of our things. Like, I couldn't do that. Like, trust me. Like, that's like, it's like, bro, what was I talking about, dude? Like, just so weird. Like, so much stuff where I was like, let's not say I was all the way on the path to uh, being a normal person again. But California was amazing, and I was there for a long time. Some of it undercover, because like, I didn't really want to be like people to know where I was. But then Forrest Galante, shout out to him, he like put me on Instagram story, and then like I was like, oh shit, like now people, because this guy has like a million followers there. So I'm in California, and dude, I loved it, because I could go out, and I'd be go filming whales with my buddy, filming the Great Whites, be playing with rattlesnakes, and it was so different, right? Like. And also, dude, hiking the Tuna Canyon, all the places in Malibu, like, I loved it. So I was like, all right, you know what? I had rented a car at the time. Dude, I had, I had all this money sitting in there. Like, when you sell that ring and shit, I was flush. You know what I'm saying? So I'd been renting a car. I would drive up to Santa Barbara and back just to go film for, like, an hour. It, dude, that, like, the gas was, like, $5.50 in there. I'm, like, literally lighting money on fire. So I'm like, okay. I kind of knew. I was, like, looking at apartments, like, around there, like, up. Malibu, so much money. I wanted to live there so bad, but it's like a billion dollars. So I'm looking at all these places, Palisades, all like San Marco. I'm like, I'm going to go back home and get my car and drive out here because I can't rent a car anymore days, you know? So I fly home and I'm landing. Craziest thing, dude. You know how they say like everything happens for a reason, whatever. Like it's all like, I don't know if that's whatever people say. And I'm on the plane. I land. And Robert Thomas texts me, like, he didn't know. He's like, yo, bro, are you in town? I'm like, yeah, dude. I'm like, I'm, I'm just landed. I, you know when you turn your phone on and it's like there? And he's like, dude, come to this concert with us. I'm like, bro, I'm on the plane. He's like, I'll pick you up, whatever, like, or meet me here, like, whatever, and we're going to this thing. I'm like, all right, dude. Like, and I go to this concert with my boy, Big Therm, who has since become a very wealthy person. But at this time, he was only making 2.8. So shout out to Therm for getting rich after this. But... One of, one of, I think, the most solid, good human beings that I've ever known and someone who really had my back in moments that he didn't have to, and I appreciate it. So I go and meet up with him. And you got to realize, in L.A., I had a lot of fun with, like, my friends, and I was feeling, like, there was moments in L.A. where I'm like, I'm back. You know what I mean? Like, I'd be filming, and I'd feel like myself. But like I said, a lot of ups and downs. I'm still, like, I'm, like showing random people my engagement pictures. Like, I remember, too, at Delilah, that girl, she was like, She's like, give me your phone. I'm like, why? She's like, I'm going to unheart all these. Like, why are all your favorites the pictures of you and your ex? I'm like, oh, like, are they? Like, I didn't even know. I'm like, oh, my God. Like, crazy. So, anyways, I go back, and we go to this concert, and it was all Thurman, all these guys on the blues and all this stuff. And I had met Jordan Cairo before, and he's, like, way younger than me. But, like, we were boys when we hung out in New York and all this stuff. And I remember we hung out that night. He's like, dude, you should come to this stuff this weekend. I'm like, all right, bro. I was planning on getting my car and going back there, right? It's crazy how life works, you know? And we went out that weekend, and James Neal was there, all these guys, like, people that I really, really love, right? So I meet these guys, Jake Wallman, Jordan Kyer, who, like, while he's, like, 27, like, he's younger than me, like, but once again, all the old guys on the team are, like, married and stuff, so it's like, they're not really going out with us, and, like, so it's like, I started hanging out with these dudes, and Therm set me up, he's like, oh, whatever, and I, we started hanging out, and it was the craziest thing because for the first time in very long, the craziest thing happened. I started to feel like a real human again, just being around the boys and like having friends and being amongst people. So the first night I went out with all them, 
Wally and Rue were like, bro, just stay at our place. Like, cause I was at my parents before. They're like, dude, just stay here. We had, they had this big house, there's two of them. They're like, dude, just stay with us. I'm like, all right. So then it kind of became this thing. I'd go and stay with them, then maybe a couple days, then whatever. Then I'm basically like living at Rosalia at this place, which I can say now, cause they moved. But Rosalia placed that. Rue tried to get us all to get it tatted. I'm like, I'm not a tats guy. Anyway, so when you're sitting on the couch watching football with all your boys, like I can't sit there and be like, you guys want to hear about my fiance? These guys didn't care. You know what I'm saying? We'd be like wrestling and like eating Chinese food and like talking about stuff. And like it started to build me into like all of a sudden I kind of got that itch again where I'm like, all right, I'm out with these guys and they're like all successful, cool dudes. And I'm like, and they were all, they didn't care. They didn't care about Barcel. They didn't care about anything. Like they, we were, they were just my boys. And I'm like, yo, like I do cool shit too. Like, you know what I mean? I kind of started getting this feeling where I'm like, Dude, I want to like pull my weight again as a human. It's hard to quantify, right? Because I think also when I left, right? When I'd walk into Barcelona, so I had Frankie Borelli, Tommy, Rudy, KFC, Feidelberg next to me every day. I had this community, right? When all this evaporated and during like all the bad stuff that happened, I, like everything that went wrong, I was just so isolated. It made it even worse. So all of a sudden I was like, all right, I'm getting my juice back. And also those guys like Wally, like he, I don't even want to say this because he's so full of it they're not short on like a little bit of like juice, a little bit of swag. So I was like, I was like, okay, I started becoming me again. And I went to film something down here and we were trying to catch this great white, which, oh, we're gonna get to that because we got him. But I got a place in Tampa, Florida, which was so random, but I'd stayed there with Pat. I came down here, I'm like hanging, I'm like, I went out a few times, I'm like, dude, this is so fun. I loved like, it was a very comfortable city, it's beautiful. And the biggest thing was like, I mean, I love Wally and Ruin them and I've since gone back and like, you know, whatever. I've spent quite a little too much time there, but um, I needed to have my own place and build again. I'm like, all right, Florida, for all the reasons why when I worked there it was good, I'm like, we're gonna build this stuff. And Wally and Rue, like when we first be talking about it, we're like juggernaut. Like they would always be gassing me up, like juggernaut, let's go. Like jug They've been trying to get me to do it for way too long. So it's not, don't yell at them if it's taking a long time they would be asking me, let me see the great white stuff. Let me see this. And all of a sudden I kind of started, it's like, I was so dead. And all of a sudden out of the mud, like I started like the little sprout started coming and the boys started putting water on it. And I'm like, they're like, yo, we want to see this. I'm like, all right, we're going to build juggernaut and we're going to make the nastiest thing. We filmed the grossest stuff. All my life, it's the grossest stuff I ever filmed. And I wouldn't just say that dude, because I'm proud of my past stuff. I may just have a few tricks up my sleeve. That's all I'm going to say. And, and I've always said since day one, I'll tell you when I'm out of tricks. When I don't have any more things up my sleeve, I'll admit it. But I got a lot of stuff up my sleeve. And that's a beautiful place to be in. And Juggernaut, listen, we have so much stuff cooked up. Stuff that I'll admit to having. Stuff that I won't admit to having. And we're coming. That's all I got to say. The tsunami's on the way. By the time you see it, it's too late. The biggest thing I would say now, as far as like growth as a human. I think me understanding that it's okay for life to not be perfect, right? Like, I think that the way that I understood stuff before was like, don't try something unless you know it's going to go good until you know it's going to go good. And then once it goes good, like you have to be undefeated, right? Like life has to go in this way that like, don't attempt something that you might fail at or whatever. And even the things that I had attempted that were risky had just worked for me, right? So I had never really dealt with like an implosion before or something. And I think this, the self-destruction of kind of like mentally that I went through after all this, the coolest part when I started to kind of get past it was like, it's okay for life to not be perfect. It's okay. A setback is like actually a really great part of the story. Like now I have to go and build it back Getting it out of the mud is 50 times better than getting it from fucking the treetops. You know what I'm saying? And that was beautiful. Like as soon as I understood that. Kind of like I had to re-engineer my brain to not be built off of external validation. And like, dude, shout out to my therapist, the smartest lady of all time. She was, has a lot of patience, but it feels like, you know what's beautiful? It feels like 2016 again, 2017, when I was doing stool scenes and doing it on the nights and weekends grinding like it's it's that's what i got that feeling back i got that hunger that like it you can feel it in your nuts we filmed a million of these really high quality interviews podcasts we filmed all these episodes the grossest stuff you ever seen 
and we're we're coming back to to take people's hearts out of their chest. Like with all, if you make outdoors, if you make entertainment on the internet, I'm gonna. I may not do it, but I'm gonna try to take your heart out of your chest because that's what we're doing now. And now, if people wanna hate me on the internet, that's okay, I'll see stuff now. And it's like, like I said, healing, it's not a linear process. There was times that it's better than others and there's setbacks. When I removed social media from my life and wasn't like only getting stuff from likes or followers, isn't it? Dude, I lost so many followers not posting. I'm like, whatever, I'll get them back. Like, it ain't that serious. It's, it's Instagram, dude. It's TikTok, like who cares? You know what I'm saying? And, it's, and that sounds like I'm not trying to be some sort of like douche. I know that sounds douchey to be like above social media. I'm not above social media. It's unbelievably vital to my business and everything. I'm proud of how I've tried to evolve my brain into not being hostage by it, if that makes sense. When we make these videos, we make it nasty and whatever people think, I could put this out and everyone hates it. I'm doing an interview with myself right now. Everyone could hate this. But it's okay, I like it, I think it's good. I wanted to say this and it feels amazing. It feels like a lot of closure. Like doing all this stuff and being here in Tampa and kind of starting fresh and like everything is temporary. You know what I'm saying? Like at that time, some things are temporary that you wanted to be forever, which is not ideal. But um, everything's temporary. The bad stuff, the good stuff, it's temporary. Goods, the highs, the lows. And even right now, I'm excited doing this interview me and you you look great bro next thing you know there's going to be a down and like i think before with barso i wasn't prepared for that and i'm sure there will be more questions after this interview i'm here to have them now we're every week we're live now and we got all these interviews coming up it's beautiful the show is gas and i'll put that on anything that trailer when we coming out of the grave does kind of gas bro like you gotta like that I look like a zombie and um it's beautiful this is a beautiful moment. I'm very grateful for MMG Studios. I'm grateful for everyone that's helped me get here because I was in a dark spot, but we're alive. I can finally take a deep breath, probably take this orange coat off because I'm sweating and we're in a beautiful place. So Juggernaut, next week we got Python Cowboy and we're going live now, we're back. And you know what? I love everyone that's had my back. Everybody's been sending me messages two years later. Yo, dude, love your stuff. When's it coming back? I fucking appreciate you guys. And I'm here to be that dog. It's, it's like 2016, 2017 again. We're hungry, we're on, we're on it. What did Lil Wayne say? The only thing on the mind of a shark is eat and that's what we are. I'm, that's what I'm at again and it's beautiful. I love you guys. That's episode one. I've been really stressing my love, lust and affection. Now I'm too over messing with girls who want to invest in